Welcome back to Faith Teen TV, speaking to the issues shaping our nation. Today, we're airing part two of our interview with Dr. Margaret Cottle, clinical assistant professor in the Division of Palliative Care at the University of British Columbia, and Alex Schattenberg, executive director of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. We're talking about the issue of medical assistance in dying in Canada. This is part two of our conversation. Without any further delay, let's get to it. In British Columbia, it's easier to get qualified for medical termination than it is to get to be qualified to receive home oxygen. That's how bad this is. And when you ask them the question about this, why are they actually wanting this? Why do they actually want to die? They always come down with the same response. They feel their life lacks meaning, purpose, or value. They feel there's no one in their life who cares. And, and it has a lot to do with the fact that as a human being, sometimes we need to have people, a significant community around us who cares about us when we are going through that difficult time. One of the patients that I went to see right before he had a medical termination told me that the main reason that he was having this was because there was just no joy anymore. And this was very upsetting for his wife of so many years, but it was one of these things where, well, if that's what he wants, he had no symptoms that were uncontrolled. It was all about control in his own life. And he'd been a very successful businessman. And I just thought so much about how this had impoverished us as a society and had impoverished his family. Here he was, this man who had given so much to his family, and he never had the chance to experience the love that they could give to him when maybe he needed some help at the end of his life. And he never gave the opportunity to his family to help him. Maybe they could say, well, dad was so independent and he did all these things for us. But at the end of his life, I could read to him. I could be with him. I could be there. And there's, there's something that's so healing and so wonderful about being there with each other and allowing ourselves to be cared for that this family never experienced. And when they didn't experience that, it impoverishes all of us. This idea that somehow this decision to have a medical termination is just an individual decision is simply false. It affects every single one of us when that happens. Another story that I wanted to relate was I had a call about two years ago from a friend of mine who said that a pr friend of hers had called her and said, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking about having made, but... I think you're maybe opposed to it, and I want to know why you would be. And so my friend called me, and she said, what do I say to this person? And she told me the medical history that this individual had. And it was pretty horrendous, and I could understand why she would be asking for that. It was pretty awful. And so we went through a lot of things, and I said to my friend, is this lady a grandmother? And she said, yes. And that's part of the reason she wants this, because she doesn't want her grandchildren to see her suffering like this. And I said, well, talk to her about what kind of a legacy she's leaving for those grandchildren. If it was okay for grandma to just check out and have somebody take her life when things got hard, what does that say to the 16-year-old or the 22-year-old who hits a really rough place that if it was okay for grandma, maybe it's okay for me to check out as well? And interestingly, of all the other things that we said about society and everything else, that was the thing that hit home to her. And she was able to get some extra medical care. She got better. She decided she was going to take a trip, which she did. And my friend wrote to me, this spring, uh, saying, I thought you would like to know an update. This other friend of hers had invited her to come out to lunch to say thank you for preventing her from going down that road because she had gotten the treatment. She was feeling a lot better. She was well enough that she could have the grandchildren to stay overnight. And she was so grateful for the two years that she had had with them and still counting that she wanted to bless 
my friend, for helping her in that situation. So for those of you who think that you don't have anything to say, you do. You have influence. You can make a difference in one person's life just by saying, well, think about this. What about this? And we care about you. We want to support you. Oh, what a powerful story and what a profound gift that that friend gave to not only that woman, but her grandchildren. Wow, that's so touching. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. The statistics do show this too, that in Canada, the reason that people opt for a medical termination doesn't really have very much to do with symptoms. It has to do with feeling like they're, they don't have hope, they don't have joy in the things they're doing anymore. They can't fulfill their activities of daily living. They're worried about being a burden to their family. All of those things are way up the list over any of the symptom management. So um, this is a really Im important thing. Yeah, Faitina, I'd like people to know about our the Compassionate Community Care Program that uh, that uh, we've been promoting. And it's very important because it's a, a training program for helping people to become visitors, to visit those people who they know in their communities, uh, people who they might know through their church communities, etc. Because uh, we have so much loneliness and uh, feelings of abandonment in our culture. And yet, you know, when you visit somebody, you truly help them find a reason to live. My experience, as I said, is... Uh, I've dealt with quite a few people who were uh, approved for MAID or, or um, you know, considering it. And it always comes down to that they feel that there's nobody in their life. They feel that they have no reason to live. And, you know, a friend can make all the difference in the world in someone's life, saying that you are important to me. Often that's all it takes for someone to say, you know, I guess you're right. Um, you know, there is a reason for me to continue living. There definitely is. Thank you so much for mentioning that program. And if you're watching this right now and your heart's being touched, definitely get in touch with Alex and, and be a part of that. The, the other thing I would like to mention to faith communities is that the, the Christian Medical and Dental Association of Canada has just put out our new series called Dying with Christ, Living with Hope. And if a church is interested, there it's a very good little series, three half-hour videos with workbooks to really help people in your church figure out how to navigate this. And full disclosure, I'm one of the speakers in the video series. But the thing I really like about this video series is that each of the speakers is given quite a long time to develop an idea. So it's very gentle. It's very quiet. It's very contemplative. And it's a way for people to who are part of the Christian community to really come to terms with what is a robust way of looking at end of life things. I think we need to bring back a little bit of what the Victorians and others did with the Ars Moriendi, like the art of dying, and how instead of this being a taboo subject, how do we make this into something we talk about more so that it isn't so fearful and people don't somehow feel like the only way to die with dignity is by lethal injection. It's not. Uh, you matter. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing about that. That's such an important point. The moment I first knew something wasn't right, I was actually in Florida with family and I was walking along a beach and I just could not concentrate. I couldn't enjoy the moment I was in. It was like a wave of darkness just hit me. And at that point I knew something, something wasn't right. I wasn't appreciating my life. I wasn't appreciating the moment in time where I was. And it just goes to show you that no matter where you are, uh, you can be in a sunny, beautiful place like Florida and still have those struggles raining down on you. I was formally diagnosed with uh, major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder at, at 16. I was doing fairly good for a period of time. However, depression can still come back to get you. At its worst, it is just a wave of darkness. It feels like you're in a, a tunnel and you're, there's no light um, and you're trapped. You go to work and that is 
the maximum energy uh, you have for the day and at the end of it you weigh in bed, you don't see friends, you often disassociate with, uh, with close family and uh, it's, it's one of the worst experiences anyone could ever possibly feel. I was just finishing up work. I had thoughts in my mind that my family didn't care about me. Uh, I wasn't good at my job. I was useless. I wasn't contributing to society. And I got home and I had this wave of darkness go over me. I tried to take my life. My friend found me along with his girlfriend and took me to the hospital where I was admitted for 12 hours. Um, they did blood work, a few tests. They had a uh, psych nurse come in, ask me a few questions. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I was, uh, I was sent out 12 hours later. I was given the number of a mental health transition team from the hospital and offered a bus pass on my way out. I didn't get prescribed any medication. I was told if I wanted a psychiatrist, it would be a six month wait. So there, there was no really solid follow up. It makes me very angry that uh, at a hospital where you're supposed to receive the proper care when you're when you're uh, ill, when you're struggling with um, mental illness, like you're supposed to receive proper treatment. And the government was offering me a chance to take my own life when I felt I had no one to reach out to and no one to talk to. I certainly would have explored that. It is vital. Um, it is vital that federal and provincial governments make mental health uh, care more accessible. My story should not have happened. I should not have had been given a bus pass and, and a wave goodbye at the hospital. It scares me the most that a lot of innocent people will lose their lives because they feel there is no path forward. They feel there is no way out. And they don't realize in that stage in, the, in their minds that uh, life can get better. We can have a much more compassionate society if we have this inner, react, inner relationship, interaction between the generations and that we focus on caring for one another rather than just figuring out how to kill each other. We believe in giving back and doing all that we can do to build a better future. What that means is that when you partner with Faith Team TV, you are partnering with so much more than an issues commentary show. You are partnering with a team that is constantly pouring out to serve Canadians and pray for them and their loved ones through special TV programming and our phone lines as well. You are partnering with at-risk youth through the children that we sponsor every single month and programs we actively partner with like the World Embrace Champions Centre and Children's Park in Gulu, Uganda. You are partnering with national prayer events where we gather believers from sea to sea in united prayer for Canada. You're partnering with the Life Room, which has already mobilized thousands of hours of prayer for the unborn in our nation, and with the Justice Wall, which mobilizes prayer for issues such as human trafficking, youth suicide, conscience and faith freedom, and for good government in Canada. When you stand with us, you're standing with every ministry that we actively sow into through our tithe. One person is a voice, but together we are a powerful force that can do so much good. Thank you for your support of Faith Teen TV and thank you for being a part of this team. Together we truly can leave the world better for the sake of future generations. We appreciate you and every gift really makes a difference.
Now, Quebec just recently passed a bill to expand their practice of euthanasia in Quebec. And one of those things they had in there is it said that all palliative care institutions must offer euthanasia. It doesn't say that, you know, it. no, they must offer it. So they, we're not even talking about now these palliative care, care institutions that are being told, well, you're going to have to do a referral because these people want this and they have a uh, legal right to it. No, they must provide it. On top of it, then there's a lot of physicians within that palliative care, those palliative care institutions who have said, no, I'm not participating in that. And yet now they're being forced in some way then to comply with it, even though they don't believe it's in any way uh, correct to kill their patients. They're being forced in some way to comply to it. In British Columbia, as you know, the Delta Hospice Society in 2021 was defunded. Uh, the, their uh, building was expropriated. Why? Because they refused to do it. They refused to do euthanasia. It wasn't that they refused to provide good care. They provided good care. That wasn't they. That was wasn't the issue at all. They refused to kill their patients. And it wasn't that there wasn't availability of this. Because that's the next thing they're going to say to you, and they're going to say, "Well, you know, Margaret, Fatine." They're going to say, "Well, you know." It's legal, so we have to make sure people have an opportunity to have their legal options, right? But the fact of it is, is they already have made teams in all of our major hospitals in Canada, these teams that go around and make sure that if you're in the hospital and you have a significant medical condition, that you know that made is an option, that they're willing to fulfill that for you. So it's not like they don't make this available. It's not like they're not promoting it. They're promoting it right, left, and center. I'll tell you a quick story. I've got a call from one of my supporters in, in uh, British Columbia. And she was all upset because her husband was in palliative care. He was nearing death. And she said, you know, there was this one doctor that came in and asked him five times. She said, how do you get this person to stop asking us if we want made? Because we've obviously said no. We said no. And we said no. And we said no. And they keep asking, do you want made? And it's insane because, of course, you have to think about this again. Yes, this is someone who clearly didn't want it. So, yes, they continue to say no. But as human beings... A lot of us go through a lot of emotional issues as we're approaching death. Um, this is normal for us to go through this. And then you've got somebody who's trying to sell this to you constantly. And you're thinking that some people aren't going to somehow say, well, maybe that is the right thing for me. And that's exactly yeah. what's going on. Your, your, your worst day should not be your last day. Absolutely. And the, the other piece to this is that they have forced this on just about every palliative care unit in the country. The only places that have been able to hold out are the faith-based ones. And there's a concerted effort to try to force them to accept this. And the, the problem is that there are, even just from a democracy point of view, um, we're up to, on Vancouver Island, they're up to 8% of deaths uh, being medical termination, being a lethal injection. That's almost one in 10 people. And there's a waiting list and people are complaining that they're not dying fast enough. I heard this from a colleague of mine. It's it's just ludicrous. We are not doing it for just these really hard cases. This is becoming the accepted, the, the way to die du jour, if you will. And so the, the problem is that when, when it becomes like this, then those of us who don't want anything to do with it, don't have a safe place to go. We don't, and, and I think even if you're just thinking of the democracy, why should you not have places where people who will never want this, who want to be safe from people asking them that, who want to be safe from even if they ask for it, that it's not available? That's where I want to go. You know, I don't want to go to a place that is um, is going to be pushing that. And it's so upside down. We're told as physicians, look, you know, be careful what you say and be careful what you suggest to people because there's a power differential. But it doesn't seem to be that way with this. Um, with, if a doctor who says, when a patient says, I wish I were dead, and the doctor says, well, let's talk about that. Let's see what some of the reasons, maybe we can reframe hope. If that doctor is disciplined, and this doctor who comes back five times saying, are you sure you don't want MAID, is not disciplined, this is where we are in our society, and we need to speak up about this. We, the, the doctors who are Hippocratic physicians who do not believe in taking life, we are 
we're on the firing line right now and we need your support. There is a good program called um, No Options, No Choice that is out there. It's a secular program that you can go to and it, it will help you. You can link to it. It will help you figure out how to contact your MLA, your um, MPP, your member of parliament, some things that you can do. And there's stories of people um, on there that are really short six minutes. It's done professionally. It's very good. So have a look at that if you're looking at ways to do this. But the other thing I would say is don't be silent around your friends. If your friends are saying, or your loved ones are saying, well, gee, this sounds like maybe a good idea. Speak up, say, you know, this would really hurt my heart if you chose to do this. We're here for you. We will help you. People, oftentimes I have found in all my years of practice, when people say, I wish I were dead, they don't really mean that. What they mean is, does my life still mean something yes, to you? Exactly, and yeah. We have that golden opportunity to do that. And let's not blow it. That is so I answered so the phone important. of the helpline. We had this woman call us who was qu quite, she had quite a few health problems. And she was um, calling, but she was actually really saying she wanted euthanasia. She was calling us, I think, because she didn't really, really want it, but she was feeling like really this was her only hope, her only choice with uh, with her situation. And I spoke to her and she spoke and I and I, listen, I mainly listened to her. And I told her, you know, you can call me back. You can call me back. She called me about five times and we talked and I, and I listened. And anyway, in her case, she called me back this spring because um, somebody living on her floor of her apartment building had been approved for euthanasia. And she called me saying, well, how do I talk to this person to convince them not to die this way? So she called me originally because she wanted to die. And now she was calling me because she wanted help in talking to somebody to prevent them from dying. And, and I think that's, uh, that's important because she needed someone to talk to. She was going through a difficult time. Uh, you know, another doctor would have said, well, there's maid. We can do that. And uh, she would have been dead. Yeah. Wow. And never underestimate the power of your one voice to say, you matter to me and that we we will miss you if you make this choice. And it's it's like any other suicide. We understand how traumatic that is, but we have this double standard. If you meet these certain conditions, we will kill you. If you don't meet them, we we prevent your we prevent your suicide. And it's a, it's a sad commentary that in Canada we now think that there are some lives that are not worth living. Wow, this is also eye opening. And you've said so many important things. You know, talking about the safe space. What about those people who want a palliative care option where they're not being offered assistance in death? Uh, that's an important question. I, I think it goes without saying too. We need to talk about the fact that Canada is currently in a doctor crisis. And so if you have doctors that are, are feeling like they can't function with their conscience intact, maybe some of them will decide to retire early. We need good doctors oh, yeah. to stay yeah. in the system, not be felt, not feeling like they're, they're having to be pushed out of their profession because they can't function with their conscience intact. These are all very, very important factors. Uh, before we close out today, Dr. Cotto, we need to talk about the Denmark model. Uh, I find this so fascinating. Can you unpack this for our viewers and, you know, maybe for some of our legislators that are watching right now, this could be an idea that they could implement on the ground. In Denmark, they have been closing hospital beds. And there was a team from Canada that actually went over to Denmark and looked at what their model was. The caveat is that they do have a slightly more homogeneous population, so it's a little bit easier to institute some of these things, but they started building um, more long-term care facilities that were more like little apartments and little communities. And there would be a library in the facility, there were bakeries, there were coffee shops. So the, the public was coming to these facilities and people felt as though they were living in a community and they didn't, they were able to close hospital beds. The other thing that enabled them to do this was that they realized that the a huge resource was the patient's families. And they supported the patient's families so that they could give them 
the best kind of care at home. And so we need to think about some of these solutions. And there, there are even some other solutions, other places where young people who need a place to stay. There's a group of music students that live in a long-term care facility, and nobody cares if they practice all the time next door. And they come and they give concerts and they eat with the residents, and everybody benefits with that, with the intergenerational uh, things that happen there with the the relationships that happen between the generations. And then all of those young people who are living with the older folks and other people who are maybe younger with disabilities, they get a firsthand view and a firsthand understanding of what it's like to be older, of what the needs are and what the supports are needed so that as they grow up a little bit more and become voters and become people who are influential in the government, then they will understand this. We can have a much more compassionate society if we have this inner inner relationship interaction between the generations and that we focus on caring for one another rather than just figuring out how to kill each other. Powerful. Powerful. Man, I feel like I've just drunk from a fire hose <laughs> listening to you guys. This has been uh, so eye-opening. And as I already mentioned, you've given us so much to think about. Let's be a part of the solution. Speak to your legislators about this. Uh, bring some of these ideas before them and continue to track with these two amazing individuals. Um, Alex, where can people find you? Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. It's easy to find epcc.ca. And uh, you can go to my blog and follow all the information. Beautiful. And, uh, you know, I know, Dr. Cottle, you're working hard there at the University of British Columbia, but you're also part of an organization, Physicians for Life. Where can people find information about that group? They're online as well, uh, Canadian Physicians for Life. It's a secular, non-sectarian organization that uh, headed up by Nicole Scheidel and doing some really great work helping out uh, with conscience protection and other things. So, yeah, check it out and check out the No Options, No Choice, too. There's some really practical things in that as well. Well, thank you for that. And thank you so much for your time today and for your expertise. Uh, we'll be watching how this all continues to unfold. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us for the second part of our discussion with Dr. Margaret Cottle and Alex Schattenberg. If you want to watch this interview again or part one of the interview or any other program that we've aired, simply go to Fateen TV where it is posted for your viewing ease. Also want to say our weekly thank you from the bottom of our hearts to our regular donors, our monthly partners. Without you, we could not stay at it. You're really the ones that make these shows happen. If you'd like to help us stay on the air week after week, we would so appreciate your consideration of signing up to partner on a monthly basis or giving a special gift today. No matter how big or small, every amount makes a real difference and is tax receivable in the current tax year. Simply go to fateen.tv to give securely online or give us a call at 1-866-844-0844 and our team would be honored to speak with you. Also, if you have a personal prayer request or a suggestion for a future show, we would love to hear from you as well. Our team is always there waiting to serve. Lastly, if you want to ensure that you never miss a show, make sure you swing by fateen.tv, sign up for our email list. And when you do, you will be notified every time a new one is posted or when we're hosting an event across Canada. Thanks again for watching. We hope to see you next week and God bless.